The Court of Azathoth Reviews Sweet Ermengarde by H.P. Lovecraft. Anyway, hello, hello, and welcome back to the show. The show where everything uh, Lovecraft is covered, hopefully at some point. I am Reese, and I am once again being joined by my co-host, Zach. Welcome back, sir. Hello, how are you? Very good. This was, um, we were definitely falling a little behind on this one, and that is mostly my fault. I'll, I'll take ownership of that, but uh, we're in... Thankfully, we're still in the part of Lovecraft's career where the stories are so short, I can, you know, get them read and, and reviewed and notes taken in a pretty convenient amount of time. So we are, uh, we're good to go there. And we are, we're smack dab in the middle of a really weird phase that I think most people forget even happened. But, yeah. um... This was that, definitely because I'd never read this. I've never even yeah. heard of this. This was something that I definitely. Uh, this isn't. This is not the type of story. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> uh, this is definitely not the type of story that you think about uh, when you think of Lovecraft, like at all. No, no, no. It was but very, I. Uh, but yeah, Gosh, we'll, we'll... this was even more satirical than his last piece. Yeah, and I thought awesome. I thought that was funny. This is funnier. And yeah, we... this is way funnier. I was like, this is like in the last one, he was almost trying too hard, and this one, holy cow, is so funny. Oh my gosh! But we'll definitely get into that later. We don't have too much in the way of news. Sorry, come back next week. Um, yeah, but... what can I... we say? You know, it is what it is. It's a very, it is, you know, despite uh, more popularity, it is a niche genre. But yep. I did have a little piece of feedback that I wanted to go over and I thought was going to resonate more with you than it does with me. <laughs> but uh -huh. so uh, we have a guy named Alan. Oh, I recognize him uh, from the main channel. Uh, he says, the Point Lookout DLC of Fallout 3 actually introduced me to H.P. Lovecraft. I won't go into details, but basically a medium-sized but difficult quest in the game was based on the Dunwich Horror and Yog sothoth Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, did you, what did you think about that? Um, I wish I could remember specifically what quest he's talking about, because I've more than likely played it and beaten it probably a couple of times. But I, honestly, I would have to... I'd have to look it up in the wiki to remember exactly what he's talking about huh. yeah because i i haven't i haven't played the game but i did uh because that kind of made me curious i did look that up and as far as i could tell um and this is actually something i'll say to the credit of bethesda it's not a very overbearing uh series of references yeah well it, it was probably they're very sparse. It's just kind yeah. of a name here or there, uh, but it's it's certainly not a recreation of the story, the Dunwich Horror. Uh, you should ask him what the, uh, or maybe I'll ask him what the uh, the name of the quest line was, so I can look it up and remember exactly what it was like. It's been a while since I played this game. Fallout 3 was so fun, though. A lot of people give it shit, but I really like this game. <laughs> you you were mentioning uh, earlier that there was there was the brain in a jar character, uh -huh. yeah. which is a reference to Whisper in Darkness and not Dunwich Horror. So so they're taking inspiration from other things. Um, as far as I could tell, in 
in the quest that I looked up where you're in a uh, a factory, I believe, that's owned by the Dunwich Borers Company. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's there's some like, <laughs> culty, funny. ancient obelisk god in the basement that is its name is supposed to be similar to Yogg-Sothoth, who is, of course, the, the father of the Dunwich Horror. So, you know, it's it's a very, it's a very, uh, honestly, I feel like most people playing the game wouldn't even get what was being referenced. Yeah. And that's totally fine. But it's interesting to hear that somebody, that was their first introduction to Lovecraft. And I guess that, that does make sense. <sighs> Yeah. Because that game is yeah. going to get more circulation than paperbacks of the story. <laughs> well, and a lot of uh, I'll, that's probably the way it is. That's probably a story we're going to hear a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's one of the most famous. Yeah. Well, I mean, in uh, video games in general, like, there are a lot of video games that make a lot of Lovecraft references. Like I said, my first like real exposure to Lovecraft was probably via World of Warcraft. I would say my first real true exposure to Lovecraft, because um, they have everyone from uh, Yog Sothoth to like Cthulhu in that game. I mean, character names have been changed slightly, so like instead of Cthulhu, you have Cthune, and instead of like <laughs> Yog Sothoth, you have Yog Saron. Just like uh, little things like that, uh, but um, and their roles have like been a little bit more well defined, I guess, in that universe than they are like in the actual Lovecraft lore. Uh, it's a little more concrete, but uh, yeah, yeah, that was easily my first real exposure, probably to Lovecraft was wow. It's so hard to say. I've mentioned the stories that were among the first I read, but I could not even begin to tell you what was my first exposure to it. Because, or, or at least I could tell you what yeah. my first exposure was, but I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Because it would have yeah, been Yeah, I guess alien. that's kind of hard to say because it's so like, it's so like deeply entrenched in sci fi. Mm -hmm. um, like, even like, the aliens from the alien franchise mm -hmm. like the xenomorphs like even they have like a lovecraftian sort of like reference to them mm -hmm. and that and that would uh definitely be mine maybe i'm missing something but uh i saw i saw that at a very uh early age so i would say that yeah. that was but i i had no idea i had right no, i had well no i mean they, because they did such a good job making it their own little original thing it wasn't like it was obvious. Like anybody that like was a Lovecraft fan back in the day probably would have gotten the reference. Anybody else would have been clueless. It was just a big alien. Um, and honestly, I like that. And it's the, it's the same thing here with Fallout. And I think another good recent example, and I've pointed this out uh, fairly recently, was the reference in the Aquaman movie. Again, it's a reference to to the Dunwich Horror, and I pointed that out in a video where they actually show a paperback of the Dunwich Horror on screen, and it's meant to parallel the story of Aquaman being from two worlds. Yeah. And it's a very blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment. Yeah. Um, I'll, but the thing is, once I, uh, once I saw the movie for the second time, I did notice it. So you, you can see it on screen enough where it's not like you're going to need to pause it. But, well, I mean, Aquaman is a fish person, so... There is that. I was I was <laughs> looking out for it, <laughs> and he returns to the sea. So uh, yeah, he there, does. There are very obvious parallels, uh, in in that's uh, with the Dunwich day, Horror yeah. and with other uh, other stories. So that's very cool, uh, and that's that's honestly, um, it's probably done more for the genre than just straight up adaptations because as has been noted in the past straight up straight up adaptations are usually not very good yeah. or they'd never happen <laughs> yeah and 
you know, that's just kind of how it has to be for a while. No. Yeah, especially like, um, and it really like, because I have yet to see a good like live action anime movie, you know what I mean? Or like a good live action <laughs> video game movie, really. Um, these are things that like, you don't see a lot. No, uh, no, no, no. A whole heck of a lot. I think the only ones that ever really did well were like maybe like the Resident Evil movies, I guess, were really popular for a while. You know, you know, the audience people's. is really desperate for a good video game movie when I've seen like videos and articles titled uh, Pokemon Detective Pikachu, finally a good video game movie. Right. And I'm thinking, what well, does this, what does I, it mean for the video game movie world when the best movie to come out that's based on a video game is a PG movie about Detective about about a Pikachu. And a, I'm just thinking like, like yeah, I guess it's <laughs> technically based on a video game, but I don't think that's where they were drawing most of their inspiration, honestly. Like, it, it's, you know, yeah, technically Pokemon has a lot of video games, but it's kind of a lot more than that. But whatever. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's how bad it is. People were really fiending for something they could call a good video game movie. Well, I mean, let's face it. The Sonic movie is going to be terrible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can't, like... I was watching a Jim Sterling video, and he's mad that they're, like, probably working a whole bunch of animators, like, over time to... Uh, <laughs> to uh, remake Sonic, because they're remaking the whole character. They have to reshoot, like, a whole bunch of stuff. Oh man, you know, want, honestly, be on that team, it, it will it will work out for them in the end because if it had come out completely unaltered, they would have been screwed. Oh yeah, yeah, nobody was gonna. Well, I mean, I don't know that anybody aside from even hardcore Sonic fans, like I don't even know if they would see this movie. It kind of looks like it's gonna be garbage, even with altered Sonic. I don't think, like, I don't think there's anything they can do to save it. It kind of looks like a generic, like, early 2000s, stupid, crappy video game movie <laughs> that has only anything tangentially to do with the story, which, I mean, Sonic's lore, if you can call it that, is already convoluted and doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> Sonic's the lore. They've, yeah, they've been everywhere. They've been all over the place with that, with that franchise, so there's no, like... There's no real cohesive story to tell, really. So I don't know what they think. I mean, and Jim Carrey is Robotnik. I don't know, man. They couldn't find anybody that like they or they couldn't put him in a fat suit at least or something. Like I don't know. I don't know. I'm just not super super excited. For <laughs> I, it. I I had no interest to begin with. I have no no connection with the with the fandom or, or the well, like material. I was never like a hardcore Sonic fan, but I've enjoyed, I enjoyed the Sonic Genesis, the 2d games on the Genesis and on the Sega Saturn. Those titles were great. Like once Sonic started moving into 3d, I kind of lost interest because there was never like most of those games. Like I had real issues with their mechanics. I had real issues with like the camera and stuff. If a game's that difficult for me to control, especially because Sonic has to really move fast. Like, that's the whole point. <laughs> like, if you can't even control where he's going, then, like, I don't know how you can play the game. And, like, there are, like, there are some people out there that, like, really enjoy the 3D Sonic stuff. I'm not one of them. I've never enjoyed any of the 3D stuff. His 2D stuff, like the classic stuff, that was always great. That was always a lot of fun, his platformers. But, you know, you start moving into 3D land, you start losing me, and then you start adding all these other characters, like, there's that shadow character, and then there's that pink hedgehog, I don't know what her name is, and then there's, like, a whole bunch of other characters that look like they're <laughs> barely the ripped one. off from other franchises, but anyway, I'm kind of going on a rant, I guess, but yeah, I just don't think it's going to be a good movie. I think they're, uh, I think it's just a corporate kind of shilled out garbage film <laughs> and i don't think it's going to be very good even with an altered sonic that's like the least of the problems with that movie and more than likely there's going to be all kinds of different problems with that movie yeah no they, they, they'll <laughs> lose a significant amount of money 
going yeah. into reshoots and shit like that. Yeah, they will. And it's probably going to... And I mean, I, I would be surprised if this movie broke even. Because <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to see it. I think a lot of people might go once just to see the unaltered... Or just to see the altered Sonic. And then they'll probably just give up on it after that. <laughs> I don't know if I can stand it. This isn't like the '90s anymore, and I can't stand to like watch Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. <laughs> they they, they seem to think the audience Carrey. is in that mindset, though. Yeah. Well, everybody, they're scraping the bottom of the nostalgia barrel at this point. I think everybody's about nostalgia out. I'm personally ready to start seeing some like truly original stuff out of hollywood again but i suppose it's probably going to be another 10 years before that happens. Yeah, you, you came for the wrong generation <laughs> i'm yep. just gonna warn you <laughs> i was looking at uh i might have i might have mentioned this before but i saw the funniest post from rotten tomatoes and it was like it was going over the big uh holiday movies that are going to come out in the 2020s and it was avatar 2 star wars a sequel Avatar 3, Star Wars sequel, and it was just alternating between these two shitty franchises. And I was like, wow, that is going to be horrible. <laughs> I could not, it's like untitled Star Wars sequel. Like, <laughs> I'm real, I'm real hyped for that, guys. Oh boy. Way to go. And Avatar, there's like going to be eight? What the fuck? There's another Avatar, like movie avatar or avatar the last airbender avatar? avatar the blue people avatar oh the blue people avatar you know what no one gives a fuck to do a i didn't even know the shitty still... m night jamalon i'd forgotten i'd forgotten about that franchise they're really making more yeah they're making like eight wow right now wow at once that's crazy yep <laughs> wow all that filming at one time for eight movies I guess that's one way to ensure that your vision remains consistent. If you're going to go ahead and do that many movies, you may as well do them all at once. I can't even imagine the vision behind it. There's no yeah. story worth telling. Yeah, it's just dances with wolves, but with aliens. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. It's rote, and it's tired, and... I mean, I don't care about Star Wars now. I don't. I, I'm not particularly interested in the next movie, let alone movies that won't have anything. They won't have any connection to. Yeah, I'm just tired of lazy writing, and it seems to me that that's everyone's biggest gripe with Star Wars is that the lighting, writing is 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 blah, lazy, and uh, I don't know if it has a lot to do with like current political bullshit. Because everybody's angry about political crap movies. And I'm like, there's always been political bullshit movies. You guys are never going to escape it. It's never going away. You may as well just accept it. Nobody ever does. Nobody ever listens to me. I understand that you just want to watch your Star Wars film. But <laughs> it's just, it's not something that's going to go away. Directors have political views just like everybody else. And they're going to put that shit in their movies. It's going to, even if they don't intend to, it's probably going to seep in one way or the other. And there's probably not a whole lot anybody can do about it. And yeah, I agree with a lot of people when they gripe about like the movie being like poorly written. And a lot of the characters aren't done very well. A lot of the characters are super annoying and look like they're only really in there to please the, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> the the mob. The mob, yeah. They're basically there to please the mob. Like, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. And like the plot, like, holy crap. Like, oh my god, I don't even like and I never cared like about Star Wars for anything other than maybe the aesthetic anyway. If you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's a cool, it's kind of a cool concept. It's kind of a cool universe, you know, whatever. I might read a comic. From time to time, I might watch one of the movies. These the characters the were never scenes. that deep, but that's, yeah, exactly. But, but that's fine because they were right. back in the day. They were likable. They were fun movies. It, it had a nice, unique look to it. Yeah. And now, I mean, the, the the biggest crime, honestly, is having characters who I don't care about. Yeah. 
I don't know. Just like the Asian chick that could have done the whole movie without her or what? She was integral. Come on. No, she wasn't. <laughs> She's my no. favorite character. God damn it. The best part. The best part was the scene where they introduce her and she tases Finn, the black guy. She thinks he's gonna because he's trying to steal an escape pod. <laughs> Apparently, which, which, which seemed kind of out of character for him. Like he's yeah, just like it was weird after every. Him. Yeah, it was really weird to me because like he'd been through all this crap with them already in the first film, and I was like, really? Like he just falls back on this? Why the fuck are they doing this again? Like they they basically did it just so that they could set those two up. And then, of course, I think that was the whole, it was the whole point, basically. And I was a little annoyed by that. Because, yeah, cause I thought he made some character development in the first film. Because Finn's not a bad character, really. I mean, I have a hard time caring about anybody in this movie. But Finn wasn't a terrible character in and of himself. It's just, I don't know. I don't like the way Disney does a lot of things in terms of films they have a pretty cookie cutter uh, formula that they stick to pretty hard and uh i don't know i think it just does uh i think it just does the film industry disservice to have so many ips owned by disney because they're never going to let those ips go disney's like a ip black hole and once something falls in and is in disney's clutches that's it like this country will bend over backwards and literally change its copyright laws in order to comport to Disney's wishes before Disney ever lets go of any IP. Like there's no saving any IP that Disney gets its clutches on. So yeah, I'm pretty sure we've talked about this with Mickey Mouse and yeah. things like that. Um, yeah, Mickey Mouse. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've gone over this before, haven't we? Uh, Honestly, it's Marvel. it's hard to avoid, so it's just going to keep coming up. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is just going to keep coming up because they own, gosh, so much, so much now. It's unbelievable. Every time I turn around, they're like they're buying like now they've bought up Fox, like the entire entertainment side of Fox. Like they own like all this stuff now. The only thing that they don't have left anymore, I think, because they bought. I don't know if they straight up own the Spider Man IP or not. Or if that's still some weird deal they've got with Sony, uh, where they're just borrowing him for a couple movies or whatever. I'm pretty sure they own him. Yeah, well, like they, uh, Sony still owns like Venom and a bunch of other characters from the Spider-Man universe, so that's going to be their next target for acquiring. Is going to be, and if they have to, if they have to acquire a part or even all of Sony in order to make that happen, they'll do it. They will do it. Hmm. I have no doubt in my mind about it. Uh, they will probably either buy up part of the company, if not the whole company, or they'll uh, give Sony an offer for the IPs, the remaining IPs that they have that uh, Sony won't be able to pass up on. Because you can't really, like, they've got, um, I know they have Mysterio for this next movie that's coming up, mm -hmm. but at some point you're going to have to reintroduce Venom into the Marvel universe or at least the Spider-Man portion of it. If you want to keep things going, um, people are probably going to want to see like maybe even an agent Venom movie or something. Cause that'd be really cool. The thing uh, is I can kind of look on, there. I can look on the bright side of this. And I think that what it does uh, is it forces Marvel studios to be creative with who they put in their movies. Yeah. So they can't just rely on okay, let's do let's do Green Goblin again, let's do Venom again. It's like okay, yeah. we've we've seen that. I... Well, I'm pretty sure the guy that plays Hawkeye in the Avengers is the same dude that plays Venom. So no, they, no, they it's Disney or is it no, somebody it's else? Tom Hardy plays Venom. Oh, is it Tom Hardy? Yeah, that's right. God, why did I think that it was <laughs> that it was Jeremy Renner? <laughs> Jeremy Renner. <laughs> they look kind of alike, I guess. Maybe they got they kind of got the disgruntled look going. Yeah, on. I don't know. Uh, no, yeah, I mean I they could do a crossover, except for the different companies. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, and the Venom story is pretty integral to like the way it's done. They would probably just have to reinvent the character and have somebody else play him. In the end, I think that would probably be the way to go because 
the movie, the Venom movie, um, they would have a hard time, like, that wasn't the way things worked in the comics, and people are going to bitch about that a lot, like, a lot, a lot. So you can't, like, uh, um, the Venom movie was fun for what it was. I actually kind of enjoyed it, but, uh, yeah, there's a there's a way that comic book fans want things, and if it's not done that way, they are going to raise shit in a way that is just, like, no one on the internet's going to shut the fuck up about it. Hmm. So, like, they if they do go about ever, like, reintroducing Venom into the Spider-Man universe, into the movie universe, uh, they're going to have to do everything they can to be as reminiscent to uh, the events in Secret Wars that led to Spider-Man getting the suit in the first place. Um and I don't know how they do that because Secret Wars is a convoluted mess in and of itself. Comic book writing is not is way worse than movie writing in a lot of ways. It's so bad, and uh, uh, the way Spider Man even gets his hands on the suit in the first place doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, there are other ways though that they could like work around that. And the uh, I think it was the. Uh, the animated series and the Spider-Man animated series, Venom is on a ship that crash lands like a spaceship, like a, a space shuttle. Uh, one of the characters' kids is like an astronaut. He's like out in space. Something happens and they crash back. Now, which is basically like all of that was reminiscent to the in the Venom film. All of that was in the Venom film. Um, that stuff was all in there, uh, but just like other stuff, like. Uh, Spider-Man's supposed to get Venom first. He's supposed to get the suit before uh, Eddie Brock does. That's why the suit doesn't like Spider-Man. Because uh, he kind of abandoned it. He kind of got rid of it. That's why it looks the way it does. Yeah. And and that's it, why looks it looks like Spider-Man. That's why it has a lot of his powers, like the webbing and stuff. Like, that's all... Uh, that's all copied from Spider-Man. So... And it's also why it's immune to his... Uh, his spider sense so like all that stuff has to happen like in some way shape or form so if instead of a crossover they would probably be better off just buying the property and reintroducing venom in their own way um but that's just what i would think from a story standpoint and mm-hmm. um, that's not necessarily what's going to happen in reality and this would be sometime down the road probably because i'm sure they've got all kinds of new spider-man movies lined up already mm-hmm. And in my opinion, they'd be better off putting villains who haven't been in movies before in their yeah. movies. And actually, yeah, I would like to see some new villains and stuff too. I would like to see more stuff involving like uh, the Scarlet Witch and stuff. I think they're probably going to try reintroducing the X Men uh, as soon as possible, anyway. So that's probably a good idea. Um, yeah, that was one of my. Uh, it was one of my initial gripes about the Avengers was that they were putting uh, the Scarlet Witch apart, making the Scarlet Witch a part of the team. I was like, really? Wow, that's ridiculous. Because she's so powerful. She's a reality bender. She's not just a magic user. She's so crazy powerful that like she probably could have won Endgame. Like, everything in Endgame that happened, she could have reversed all of it all on her own without any help from anybody. If she was as powerful like in the movie universe as she is in the comics... Because she's that ridiculously strong. Her powers are insane. Like, there's no, like, there's no, in a fight between Thanos and the Scarlet Witch, Scarlet Witch would probably win, like, nine times out of ten. And in the movie, she gets bitched out twice. Yeah, I mean, she did, she did kind of, she did kind of hold her own there for a little bit. But, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I would I wouldn't mind seeing like I hope uh, all this clamor for like good female superheroes like leads to an actual good female superhero movie besides just Wonder Woman, which wasn't <laughs> as great as everybody said it was. So I don't I don't know. <laughs> Keep waiting. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like if they did it right, if they weren't lazy about it, like here's the deal: they could have made Star Wars a decent film with the female lead. It's not the female lead that everybody gripes about. It's the way she's written because she's written like freaking eight year old. Like, with the, did this movie? I don't know. 
It's just they don't make anything difficult for her at all. She just does it all on instinct, everything. <laughs> and it's just, that's so lazy. It's so lazy. There's no reason to do that all the time. It's just lazy. I understand they want her to be like abnormally well connected with the force and all that, but like it's just. Ah, oh, that story is so rote, though. Yeah. I'm so tired of chosen one stories. Yeah, me too. Bullshit. Even like, there's like a way to do good chosen one stories, you know what I mean? And like, this, this isn't it. So at this point, we are going to get into the story, uh, Sweet Ermengarde by H.P. Lovecraft. I'm going to be handling as well as I can the beat-by-beat beat synopsis, uh, and Zach, feel free to jump in with any observations that you mm -hmm. might have, or things mm -hmm. that I probably missed. <laughs> and uh, this one, uh, this one, just to give a little background, is written under a pseudonym, mm -hmm. Percy Simple. Yep. So... Uh, and it's also a it's another satire comedy story. This this time it is Howard doing a satire of romantic melodramas and rags to riches type stories. And it is uh now granted, I haven't read everything, but this so far and from everything I know is the funniest story he wrote. Yep. This story Probably is fucking so hilarious. Yeah, it really is. It's so funny. Um, another thing about this story that a lot of people might not know. <clears throat> um, it was written, they believe, sometime between 1919 and 1921, but uh, scholars state that it's the only work of fiction by uh, HPL that cannot be dated with precision. 
and was first published in the Arkham House collection Beyond the Wall of Sleep in 1943. So he wrote it almost two decades before it was ever published. Yeah, that's going to be something we see with a lot of stories. Yep. But it's interesting. This is the one that they're not they're not sure about. Yep. Somewhere, I'm somewhere in there. Sure. Yep. I'm not quite sure when he wrote it. Um. But anyway, to uh, explain the story, there is a uh, a young sixteen year old uh, farm lass named Ermengarde Stubbs, and she is the daughter of Hiram Stubbs, and. <laughs> Right off the bat, I love I love that her name was originally Ethel, but <laughs> her father made her change it because it reminded him of Ethel alcohol, mm-hmm. and it's this story takes place during Prohibition. Yep. So he didn't want to be reminded of alcohol, so he said, "You you need to change your name." Already, you can get a you can get a feel of the kind of story we're we're about to get into. So it's a very, uh, by the numbers, uh, it, it follows every stereotype that you see in this type of story. She has two suitors who want her hand in marriage. Uh, one of them is named Squire Hardman, who is the the most mustache-twirling, literally, uh, cackling, stereotypical villain that I have ever seen in any story. <laughs> um, this guy is... Uh, this guy's unbelievable. But yeah, basically, he, just literally. just to explain his his uh, motivation, he's out for a, he's out for a ride on his horse, and he finds that there's a vein of gold on the Stubbs farm uh, property. And his grand plan, even though he at any point, and we'll we'll get back into this, at any point could just foreclose the farm. His grand plan is to marry Ermengarde, mm-hmm. and then he'll he'll have a right to the gold, and he can add. He's already rich as fuck, but he yeah. he wants to add more to his wealth because he's just such a cackling villain. But anyway, what were what were you going to say? <laughs> um, he's such a cackling villain. There's a part in there where uh, he literally kicks puppies. Uh. Oh yeah, <laughs> he kicks, like he he's literally like twizzling his mustache and like laughing maniacally to himself while he's watching Ermengarde or whatever. And like, no, he he kicks a cat. That's right, a cat comes by and was minding its own business, and he kicks it. Oh, I thought man. that was hilarious. I was like, oh my god, really? Like, this is got this is like. Uh, oh, so I th- see it. Yeah, this guy's <laughs> like. Uh, um, so this guy. Uh, Squire Hardman is his name. He's literally, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these old cartoons where like the villain is wearing like a top hat and like a black cape with like a black suit. And he has like these like big handlebar mustache, right? And he's yep. like twizzling it and he's got some woman tied up to the railroad tracks and he's laughing maniacally. Like that whole thing right there, like that is this story essentially. Like this is, that's a play on that. It's so funny. I thought that was so hilarious. I laughed really hard at that. I think it's funny that there was someone like Lovecraft who knew that that was garbage back in the day. Yeah. And it was making fun of it during during a time when that had to have been such an such an uh such a an often a depiction yeah. of villainy. Yeah. It's just this totally one-dimensional so cackling <laughs> <laughs> uninteresting villain uh but anyway so she has she has another suitor and <laughs> if you th- if you thought the last guy was good this guy is named jack manley which yep, and he's the protagonist of our tale kind of <laughs> he's kind of a shitty a protagonist hero. but we'll yep. get into that yeah. he, he's described as having curly yellow hair and they have some very nauseating romance that is filled yeah, with like my darling my precious just dumb it's shit. very puppy love like old timey puppy love crap this obviously throws a wrench in the works of squire hardman because it appears that uh jack manley is going to win ermengarde's hand 
and marriage. I particularly love the end of the first chapter because it, it has them doing their puppy love, uh, Ermengard and Jack. And then someone says, my God, in a very disgusted way. I'm not sure if that was supposed to be Hardman or the audience <laughs> or... And then, and then between the chapters, it's kind of weird. Uh, but it, it says "curtain" over and over, yeah. like this was supposed yeah. to be a stage play. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find anything about that, but it it could be potentially. Yeah, um, that's how it's written. That should have been the audience's reaction to just the <laughs> the very over the top melodramatic melodramatic romantic storyline. Oh my god, <laughs> black. <laughs> Oh man, but anyway, so so they they they're in love, um, and then we get to the part, <laughs> we get to the part where Squire Hardman is literally, he's twiddling with his mustache, and he kicks a cat. Yeah, <laughs> an unquestionably innocent cat. I I like that description too. Yeah. A cat yeah, who's just, just minding, minding walking own. by, <laughs> walking by. Crap. And if you oh, think that's funny. Uh, literally squire hardman says curses yeah yeah that's right <laughs> curses i, I am funny. foiled in my plot to get the farm and the girl no oh. curses. he was just gonna foreclose anyway wasn't he and that's why jack uh oh we'll get to that he should have he's yeah. an idiot villain and he he has yeah. he has this plan that's needlessly <laughs> convoluted yeah you must call yeah he basically could achieve everything he wants from moment one, but he chooses to fuck around and just cackle, and that yep. is his undoing. Um, so I don't feel too I don't feel too bad for him. But uh, he also swears revenge. So basically, he you know his plot, his initial plot is foiled, but he uh, he's going to take it out on Jack Manley. Essentially, he's mm -hmm. he, Jack Manley is not going to win. In his view. Uh, right. So he, he ends up going by the farm and he basically tells the dad, if you don't give me your daughter to marry, then I am foreclosing this bitch. And the farmers, of course, like, no, no, please. And he, and he literally says, she must be mine. <laughs> I will make her love me. None shall resist my will. Either she becomes my wife or the old homestead goes. <laughs> I fucking love this guy. <laughs> what a dweeb. Yep. Oh, That's what he is. He's great. <laughs> Just cackling. A cackling villain. But it's done yep. right because it is so self-aware. Yep. I love it. So uh, he, he ends up leaving. And of course the two young lovers come back. To give their good news that, oh, we're in love. And of uh, this is met with bad news that, well, if you don't, your your love is going to have to wait. Because unless you marry this douchebag, then we're going to have to foreclose the farm. Yep. At that point, Jack Manley becomes a hero uh, and decides that he is going to go to the big city uh, to try to, you know, chase fortune and fame to get enough money to uh, to pay the mortgage and mm -hmm. uh, rescue his bride to be, and I like. I, I actually I love that before he leaves, Ermagard Ermagard uh, reminds him uh, to get a ring. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From uh, yeah, she's very specific too about what kind of ring she wants and where she wants it from. It's very funny. Holy cow! She does this twice to him. Actually, she did it to him in the park scene too. And they were all being lovey dovey. <laughs> she told him exactly what kind of a ring she wanted from them. Oh That's yeah, funny. she did. Yeah, I missed that. The his reaction to that is just to say, "Oh," <laughs> like because of course on his mind he, he's thinking he has more important things to do, like saving up money for the mortgage, because presumably this is on uh, limited time that they have to pay this off. Um, but yeah, she she seems more concerned with the. Uh, with the ring, which is which is funny, and it's definitely a riff on this on this type of story. Uh, so anyway, uh, Squire Hardman, <laughs> in case he wasn't villainous enough, he goes and hires some henchmen. 
And, uh, well, they kidnap uh, Ermengarde and uh, take her to some horrible hole in the wall. I uh, hold her against her will. And uh, <laughs> he's basically toying with her and says he'll break her spirit. You know, reminds her of the parents. You know, you, you don't want them wandering homelessly. And uh, he literally cackles in her face. Oh, and that's the end of that chapter. <laughs> Uh, after that, <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, this is, this is even better. So, at some point, Squire Hardman, he realizes that he's being an idiot, and that he could have just foreclosed on the farm, and gotten access to the gold vein at any point, and he, and he literally says, Fool that I am! Why did I ever waste all this trouble on the girl? When I can get the farm by simply foreclosing. I never thought of that. I will let the girl go, take the farm, and be free to wed some fair city maid, like the leading lady of that burlesque troupe which played last week at the town hall. So he actually becomes an intelligent character. <laughs> and decides to not just marry some farm girl, and decides that he can just get the gold. You're all good. What do, what do you what do you think about uh, Squire Hardman realizing what an idiot he was? Oh, that was one of the funniest scenes. I thought that was one of the funnier parts. Uh, yeah, he uh, he's just like I'm such an idiot. I could have done this this way the entire time, and then uh, yeah, he lets the girl go, and like so she uh, she kind of um, she goes back to the farm. And yeah, like, at this point, uh, some hunters stumble on the farm, and one of yeah. them discovers gold, because apparently it's just laying everywhere, and everyone else can find it except for the people who live there. Yeah, except for, yeah, that's another thing, too, is, like, what the heck is wrong with these people trespassing on someone's property, and then, like, they don't even bother to tell them that, hey, you've got a gold vein on your property, they're just trying to get the. They just straight up try to get the property mm -hmm. from these people. <laughs> Th this this fellow is named Algernon Reginald Jones, the mm -hmm. hunter. He fakes that he has a, a rattlesnake bite to go get help from the homestead. Mm -hmm. uh, when when he when he finds uh, Ermengarde, opens the door for him. He has uh, two goals in mind: get the gold and marry the girl, yeah. uh, because he's a bit of a scumbag, as we will soon learn. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but basically, he uh, he hangs around the house for a while, and he he somehow convinces uh, Ermengarde to to leave and, and to yeah. be his his bride to be. Apparently, she just likes being tossed around as potential yeah, brides. Yeah, she doesn't really seem uh, very dedicated to any any one man, does she? No, but it, it makes her kind of a strong character because she's she's just trying to get ahead, honestly. <laughs> right, exactly. Like that's something that like. They make it pretty obvious that like she's really just interested in like the cash. Or so this is so bad. <laughs> while they're going, uh, some so in the in the in the days afterward, they're going to the big city on a train. Uh, Algernon falls asleep, and uh, when he does so, a uh, a piece of paper falls out of his pocket, and she decides to uh, snoop and reads it, and it is a love letter. <laughs> From another yep. woman, yep. And at Both this point, and everything, <laughs> she she calls him a, a scoundrel uh, yeah. and says she's done with him. And then <laughs> she chucks him from the car. She pushes him out of the window of a moving mm -hmm. train. Yep. And uh, yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> but that was one of the funniest parts to me. Oh man, what I thought was funny is when she gets off the train immediately after, and like she's like curses. I forgot to grab his pocketbook. Yes, that's so great. <clears throat> oh, it's great because you're you're thinking for a moment that maybe she regrets her actions, <laughs> but she just regrets not robbing him before potentially murdering him. Of course, he'll come back, so he's not he's not dead. But yeah, she could have very easily killed him that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so during this time, she's, she realizes, obviously, she didn't steal the pocketbook. She's in the big city, and she has nothing. She can't find Jack Manley. Um, she has no, nowhere to go. Uh, she, she turns down a job to be a dishwasher. And 
she basically what what ends up saving her is she she finds a uh she finds a purse and she returns it to its owner mm-hmm. and the owner happens to be a uh an aristocratic woman named Mrs. Van Itty, mm-hmm. or ID, or whatever, and mm-hmm. uh, she's so grateful uh, for this this uh, honesty uh, and giving back her her possessions that she she adopts uh, Ermengarde because it reminds her of the time that she had a daughter. So she uh, she does that, and honestly. Um, if people if people have seen the movie Greta, this scenario usually doesn't go this well. Yeah, <laughs> there's a reference. Also, this this chapter ends randomly with Squire Hardman <laughs> cackling again for no yeah. reason. He's just yeah. cackling to himself. <laughs> oh no, no, he's cackling because the old folks still can't pay their mortgage. Right, and he's just that evil that apparently. Forcing old farmers from their home is a hilarious situation to him. Yeah. Anyway, it gets into the the final chapter, and at this point, uh, at this point, uh, Ermengarde is fully adopted into this uh, by this by this rich uh, Van Itty, and uh, she's she has chauffeurs. She's you know, she's basically she's risen Living to the, the top. Dream. Yep. And she uh, she comes across Algernon. Uh, who's still alive somehow? Um, I'm not. I don't. They don't bother to explain. Uh, he he comes with his wife, who's presumably the woman who wrote him a love letter. Yeah. And uh, he he asks for her uh, her forgiveness, and she gives it and uh, raises his salary because apparently she owns him now, <laughs> which is which is funny. How the tables have turned. Indeed. At this point, she she kind of remembers. Uh, I don't. We we don't even really uh, get. Uh, time frame for how much time has passed she's been just enjoying this rich lifestyle and she's she remembers oh shit i came here for a reason i yeah. need to go back and and you know help Save the old folks farm. out on the farm yep. and so she she ends up she ends up getting there and literally says to squire hardman stay villain <laughs> you are foiled at last <laughs> and she gives him his money and uh he's he's very uh he's very perturbed by this. He's still twisting his mustache. Yeah. And he and he's uh he's been foiled uh mm-hmm. once and for all. Um and th- there's a joyous reunion with her and her and her family. And who should return at the uh, same time but Jack Manley, Jack Manley who's yeah. been completely forgotten about for most yeah. of the story. Which is fine because he's got his own new girlfriend in tow. <laughs> Yeah, he's not he's not very uh, faithful either, and he yeah. he's very forgetful. So he and yeah. Ermengarde are a lot more similar than uh, it's probably good for them. But yeah, he comes back with a new wife, and he's he's asking the squire for like a loan and uh, just to start uh, start things on the farm. Um, but basically. Uh, Ermengarde is just like totally over it. Just she says, "Yeah, we're prosperous now. We're rich, and the only thing I ask is that you forget that we were we had a thing because that's yeah. over." <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay, that's that's the end for Jack Manley. <laughs> um, you you have no more interest in this uh, or any uh, place in the story. Uh, at some point, Mrs. Van Itty uh, she comes to the realization, or just in her mind, that. Ermengarde's true mother uh, stole her from yeah. her, and so yeah. she's actually Ermengarde's true mother, which is yeah. even something... though there's like an age discrepancy. Because yeah, she, she said that it happened 28 years ago, and Ermengarde is 16. And Ermengarde is 16. Yeah. So that's why at the beginning, she I think she says something about pretending to be 30, even though she yeah. obviously doesn't look 30. Um. But that that doesn't really go anywhere, uh, because <laughs> Ermengarde realizes this. But uh, she's she's very much at a crossroads because she she can't keep all of the wealth that she so wants. Because if she goes with Mrs. Van uh, Itty and says that I'm your rightful heir, I am your daughter, then she does not get the gold that right. uh, her actual family has. Yeah. And so she goes for a third option uh, and inflicts a, a last punishment on Squire Hardman <laughs> and says that she's reconsidered. 
and that if you do not marry me, I will have you prosecuted for kidnapping me <laughs> and to leave the mortgage behind. Uh, and basically, she is going to spend all of his money. And of course, Squire Hardman has no choice, and he has had his final comeuppance. <laughs> and that is the story. <laughs> You know, you're going to come inside with me right now. We are getting married, and I'm spending all your money, or else you go to jail. <laughs> yep. You know, for all the bitching that I'm sure a lot of people could do about uh, Lovecraft's views and, and his lack of diversity in stories, I have to say, uh, they have not read this story. Because, no. granted, this character is selfish, but this character is hilarious. Yeah, this whole thing was funny from top to bottom. Everyone's so over the top. So funny, Ermengarde. Just like she's just she only cares about herself, and you can tell she only cares about herself. It's so funny. <laughs> you almost feel bad for uh, Jack Manley, but then you, at the end of the story, you realize that he's just just out doing his own thing anyway. <laughs> so, and you're right because at the beginning, uh, during the first conversation she has with Jack, she does she does mention the ring. And she mentions mm -hmm. like, oh, it's at the Perkins store. They have such nice imitation diamonds. Yeah. So like, <laughs> basically, as soon as she has a man in her in her clutches, she's she's trying to get jewelry or a yeah. favor from them. Something, something out of them. And she ends up on top by the end. Uh, yeah. It's a very uh, it's a very over the top satire and, and parody of of this genre, and that's what makes it fun. And yeah. it is it is unironically I, I mean it i you know because people will say this and it's not usually the case i did laugh out loud at a lot of this story like i was listening to it and it was like oh my god did that actually just happen did he really just say curses did he really just kick the cat you know <laughs> yeah there's a guy named jack manley i mean come on it's yeah. it's great it is a great story it is so fucking funny it is yeah this is a good one do you do you have any uh it's kind of it's kind of a pretty straightforward one there's not a whole lot of uh theories we can get into and obviously we're not even going to bother trying to connect it to the mythos because fuck that obviously, yeah um, <laughs> but did you have any final thoughts on this one um no i think we did i think we covered it pretty well I think we covered pretty much everything i felt like we needed to cover uh it was funny. Uh, it was a clever little story. Um, just a little subversive something. Uh, yeah, this was definitely. Um, this was definitely. I think uh, one of his more obscure, probably even better written pieces. So uh, it was pretty funny, uh, especially for like one of his. It was probably one of his earlier takes. Yeah, based on the. Uh the obscure dating as you mentioned yeah. before it, it's still uh it's still very early on yeah. and i don't know what what do you think about because no one associates lovecraft with comedy and no. now we've read two stories in a row that were very comedic and this one even more so yeah. um were were you expecting that going in at all um not not really, no. Um, but I think a lot of that has to do um, with his reputation or anything else. And like, I've always tried to keep an open mind about these types of things because usually, uh, like, a lot of comedians actually make really good like drama writers, and vice versa. Um, the two are kind of the the two are kind of linked in a way in terms of uh, in terms of. Uh, Mm -hmm. well, well a good example is uh you know we talked about him last time jordan peele has made right. that transition there are a lot of people like that mm -hmm. and uh, i thought this was a pretty admirable early attempt by by lovecraft to uh bring a little bit of comedy into people's lives uh I like that because we're so early on he still clearly hasn't found his legs yeah. Even but though he is writing good things, he still right. hasn't found his real bread and butter. Right. So it it's what it what it does for this show is that it means that there's going to be a lot of surprises along the way and that's 
good by my estimation. You know, pretty soon we're going to get into his little foray into fantasy. And that's very different. So I like that um I like that it's just it's not just one thing and it's not it's certainly not what everyone associates with it. Mm-hmm. The stories, and we've mentioned this before, the stories that people really remember, we're not going to cover for a long time. Yeah. They are they are well into his career mm-hmm. for the most part. And but it, but it's it's another one of those things where, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more in an, in another episode. But um, it makes you wonder what it would have happened if he had uh, lived longer, if he would have yeah. stuck with what he what he's known for today, or if he would have tried something else, yeah. um, gone back to something like this. It's yeah. it's hard to say. No, I definitely. Um, I definitely. We definitely. He definitely died. Uh, before his time, before he was really ready to go, I think. Yeah, he was just coming into financial success to a degree. Yeah. He was really hitting all of his classics, mm-hmm. and then just poof, candle goes out. Yeah, it's a pity. But uh, anyway, that's going to do it for this week. Of course, uh, you can reach us by sending us feedback to either our email or just leaving a comment in the comment section, and we will get to that. I, I very much enjoy that. So more feedback is definitely appreciated. Uh, you can uh, you can also uh, find me at uh, at as a at as a as a thoughts servant. <laughs> Bleh, that's kind of a mouthful. At Twitter <laughs> or my Twitter account. As a uh, thoughts. <laughs> um, as a thought servant. As a thought as a thought servant. At Twitter. Um, Absolutely, I've got that link down below, and your. Uh, your art portfolio. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. Or you guys can probably reach me on my YouTube channel at Ziggy Zag. Ziggy uh, Zag attack. Ziggy Zag, where I do a bunch of video game related stuff. Mostly video, mostly stream my video game development work, but I talk about video game news and just other stuff too. So very cool. Uh, we will see you all next week. And it looks like we are going to be covering Polaris. So yep. tune in for that. Yeah, that's a good story too. So that's going to be a good foray into the uh, fantasy realm. Very good. We are going to say adios for now. Yep. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good week.